I think we need to be reminded sometimes, and probably more regular than we think about it, but I think we need to be reminded when we approach the Sermon on the Mount, as we've been in since uh, January, and we're going to be cluding up here in the next couple of weeks, um, we have to approach it with humility. And in fact, when we come to God's Word, it's really with a deep sense of a need. Uh, there's a desire, there's, we know there's a need for God, for His love, His grace, His mercy, His forgiveness. Um, just like what John and Chris were just singing, you know, um, Zach Williams' song, you know, more, more of Jesus and less of us, which is what John the Baptist said. You know, he must increase, we need to decrease. Um, but there's that part of it. When we start coming to God's Word, we will start seeing very quickly His Word as it starts to open up before us, starts to really start teaching us and showing us about our poverty of spirit, how we really are broken, um, and also our moral bankruptcy. There is no such thing as morals apart from God and His Word. And so then as we start having this realization that we cannot begin to live the Sermon on the Mount or in, in any part of God's Word, that we can't even begin to live it apart from God. Don't even try, because it's not going to work. And so it's that realization, I think, that starts setting in that we need Him. We need Christ. We need the Holy Spirit. And it's the key to living the life that God wants us to live. As one commentator put it, we need to approach God as beggars and receive grace to do the impossible that only God can do in and through us. And so the reality is your relationship with the triune God is far more than just a relationship of salvation. That's really just the beginning of it. And so we've been reading about that in the Sermon on the Mount. It sets down the surpassing righteousness, humility, sincerity, purity, and love that is expected, that Christ is expecting of those who are going to be members of the kingdom of God, God's children. And like you've heard me say, and I'll keep saying it, because unfortunately there's a false gospel truth out there, not everybody is a child of God. Everybody is created in the image of God, but you only become a child of God when you accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And so that's who this is written for. If you're a child of God, this is written for you. And so those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord through repentance and taken that public step of faith in baptism, this is for you. And in the preceding text, which Brother Chris went over a few weeks ago, in verses 1 and 6, Jesus said, you know what, before you can even begin to pull the speck out of your brother's eye or sister's eye, you need to pull the plank out of your own. We can't even begin to attempt to remove someone else's speck before we do that in our own lives. In other words, is your heart, is your life, is your mind, is your soul right with God before you would even start talking to somebody else about theirs. And the reason for judgment then is not that we might condemn others. The only one who gets to condemn is God because He's justice, He's righteous, He's holy, we're not. But that we might be able then to minister to them. And Jesus dealt with the individuals, right? According to their needs, and their spiritual conditions. He didn't approach everybody the same. How did he approach Nicodemus? He talked about being reborn, about rebirth, the new birth, which Nicodemus didn't, didn't grab hold of at first. And how did he speak about to the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman? He talked about the living water. The point being is Jesus, the triune God, will meet you right where you are. 
because we're all at different spots and different times. But he never intends to leave you where you found him. You know, we always say, did you find God? Did you find Jesus? And the reality is, Jesus and God were never lost. We were. So it's not that you found them, they found you. God is the one that called you into the relationship. But Jesus warns us though, doesn't he? Like Chris talked about, for the judgment you pronounce will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Back in verse 2. I don't know about you, but that should be terrifying to us. Because who's adequate for such a thing? How can we live in such a high standard? And the reality is, we can't. We can't even begin to live there until we are cleansed by God through the repentance and through the blood of the Lamb. And so right after judgment, Jesus is talking about pulling the speck out of your brother's eye. He says, now you need to pray. And so in Matthew 7, 7 and 11, Jesus describes the way a child of God prays. As we pray to understand what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. And the instructions, and the instructions here should not be taken out of context as we can sometimes do with Scripture. Because all of us have heard this done. We've heard people say, well, the Bible says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. That's what it says. Therefore, all we have to do is ask for it with faith and perseverance and persistence and we will get it. After all, it says in James 4, 2 as well, you do not have because you what? Do not ask. So they say, go for it. You name it, you claim it, and it's yours. And to quote Colonel Sherman Potter from MASH, that's a bunch of horse hockey. It's not biblical at all. The reality is this view sees God as a celestial vending machine. You push the right buttons enough times in prayer and persistence and maybe in the right order and you're going to get what you want. But like it says in James 4, 2, you do not have because you do not ask. That's true, right? That's what it says. But keep reading. And what else does it say? You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your own pleasures. You haven't gotten it because your motives are wrong. God knows that. He knows it better than you. And so the reality is, this text is not a blank check for material desires. Rather, it's telling us how to pray for the character of the kingdom in our lives. Because remember, always look at how Scripture is written here, because it's mapped out pretty closely. No coincidence that we just got done talking a couple weeks ago about judgment. And then he says, now you need to pray, because next week we're going to go into what we call what? The golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have others do unto you. But sandwiched right in between those two is what? Seek God. You need to be praying. And while seeking and praying, we're going to address the log in our eyes before we'd even begin to address the sin or the speck in somebody else's eye. And what it shows us as prayer is that our morals and our ethics would be like Christ. So in a word, Jesus is teaching us how to pray for our spiritual lives, our spiritual walk. Because God, you might not know this, might be a little nugget of truth that you haven't heard, though I've said it before. Because the reality is, 
God is more concerned about your spiritual well-being than he is your physical well-being. Did you hear that? God is more concerned about your spiritual well-being than he is about your physical well-being. Because it's out of your spiritual well-being where God comes through and where your physical well-being then comes out of, not vice versa. And so we go into Matthew 7, verses 7 and 11, and we read what Jesus says. Again, this is right after he's talking about judging somebody. And right before, do unto others. So starting at verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, who gives him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask it? Again, look at where this is sandwiched in between. Because it sounds like Jesus is talking about persistence and perseverance. Jesus' words are about persevering. In other words, don't be given up. And persistence, doing it, keep doing it. And this per perseverance and persistence can apply, aptly apply to every area of our lives as children of God, as Christians. No exceptions. And as a child of God, there is no area off limits in your life to God. If there is, that's the log in your eye you need to be addressing with God. We won't receive if we don't ask. Ask and it will be given to you, he said. And Jesus uses that same example again. We read a little bit more detail in Luke 11. The same passage here, but Luke 11, asking the bread of gifts, the bread to give to the guests who have arrived and need something to eat. And one of the things we need to remember, especially at this time, and it still applies today, we need to remember, and maybe it's the case in your family, hospitality to travelers was a very big thing. For the host not to be hospitable and set before their guests, what they needed is a great breach of the societal norm, of the accepted standards. Something that would cause extreme embarrassment to that family on the part of the host. And so it's very true in Jewish life as well. I remember growing up, and, I, and Sherry and I have talked about it, you know, whenever we would go see our grandparents, we would go see her grandparents. And if you just popped in, my grandma would always say, oh, just wait a second, have a seat. She'd go put the coffee on, she'd run into the freezer and grab out something she had made a while ago, let it sit a little bit, let it thaw out. It was cookies, brownies, whatever it was. But there was the hospitality. And so that's what we see in Luke 11. That they would be so persistent in begging their neighbor for bread at midnight. Midnight, they had people show up, so they come over. Hey, Bernadette, can I have a loaf of bread? I've got some people. Right? But here's the reality, at least for me. You come to my house at midnight, I'm not thinking you need a loaf of bread. You might be lucky if I come and answer the door. And if I do come answering the door... I'm probably coming with my little Louisville slugger. But that's not hospitable, is it? No. And the odds that somebody would come to your door and ask you for that also show something about the demeanor of the relationship, right? And yet that's what Jesus is talking about here in these verses. It's perseverance, it's persistence in prayer with the conviction 
In other words, the belief, like it says down here at the close of verse 11, if you then being evil, now how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask? Remember, God isn't going to do something or provide something that will go against who He is or be a detriment to you as His child. And so Jesus says in Luke 18, 1, then men ought to always ought to pray and not lose what? Heart. In other words, don't give up. Don't stop. I like how John MacArthur said this about in, from Luke 4 and even the persistence in Luke 11 and James 4. It's John MacArthur said, True joy, peace, happiness, and meaning, hope, and fulfillment in life come only from God. Unbelievers, however, are unwilling to ask for them on his terms. They refuse to submit to God. The sad part is I think there's believers who say they're believers are not willing to submit to God either. But you have not because you ask not. Scripture does say that. And recently we announced, it was a couple months ago, a solar panel project for Junior's Garden Hope of Children Orphanage in Haiti. And so folks contacted friends and family members in the church telling them about this project. We posted it on Facebook. We shared information. And guess what happened? People started contributing to it slowly, but people contributed it almost immediately. We received contributions simply because we did what? We asked. Plain and simple, we asked. And all those who gave had a desire to give. They wanted to help. And last Sunday, we presented a check to Feed My Sheep Ministry to cover the whole project cost. $5,518, right? Give or take. That's what was raised. Because why? Because we asked. And you did it. And it is true. You have not because you asked not. But remember... What's the motivation for your asking? Are the motives going to be honoring to God? So one of the reality is, as humans, we are fallible. We make mistakes. We're not perfect. And only God and God alone can judge perfectly. Therefore, we pray and seek his wisdom and direction. How many of us have asked God for guidance in a situation? All of us, right? We've all asked God for guidance in a situation. James 1.5 says that. If any of you lacks wisdom, anybody in here lacking wisdom? Anybody want more wisdom? especially to live the life that God wants you to live. He says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Right? And then it says, who gives to it all liberally and without scolding. And I will give to him. In other words, God says, I'm going to give it to you. You want wisdom? I'll give it to you. And I will give you so much, and I'm not even going to scold you for asking me. When I read that, I thought back to King Solomon in the Old Testament. He was viewed as the richest and probably the wisest man in all of history. And yet, what did he do? He asked God for wisdom how to be the leader over the nation of Israel. He prayed to God, and the Lord graciously answered him in 1 Kings 3.3. 3. So if we are to have spiritual discernment, we must keep on asking God. We have to keep seeking Him. Keep on knocking on the door. 
that leads to the greater ministry for God. Because the reality is, God meets the needs of His children. And God is supposed to be the first one that we go to. I just had a conversation recently with somebody about a situation. And I said, well, have they gone to their church? Have they gone and talked to their pastor? And the answer was, no. Why not? Why would you not come to the body of Christ? Take a moment and look around you. Take a moment and look around you. What do you see? This is what the Bible calls a cloud of witnesses. You're all believers in Jesus Christ. You're the ones I'm supposed to come to. And yet this is the last place a lot of people, believers, want to come and ask for help. And yet this is the place on Sunday morning, if you're just broken and you're just hurting, you should be able to come here before the cross and get on your knees and confess and repent. But you know why it's the last place people come? Because we're so freaking judgmental. Because we're more concerned about the speck in Chris's eye, which I can pick out, especially with my new glasses, I can pick out, but I got a big Douglas fir sticking out of my own. And Jesus says, you need to be praying about it. Get on your knees. But it's this cloud of witnesses. And it makes me wonder then, if we persisted in our prayers, we've asked God for guidance. But what if we ask God for spiritual what if we persist in our prayers for spiritual growth? For ourselves and for others? Do we ask, seek, and knock for renewed mind? As it says in Romans 12. You want to be transformed and not be conformed to this world? Then his word says, and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What if we prayed for that? Do we keep on knocking for a forgiving spirit? Or for the removal of anger? Or how about the removal of a critical spirit? Do we pray that we can be salt and light in this community where we work, where we live, where we play? Do we pray for God to give us opportunities day in and day out to show His love and His grace to our neighbor? And I can tell you this, if you ask God, Lord, give me somebody to love, He's going to probably put somebody on your path that is going to be so unlovable that the only way you can love them is by the grace of God. Because if you can do it in your own strength, in your own mind, in your own thought, in your own way, then what do you need God for? And yet, that's what He wants from us. That we have to rely on Him. But consider that. Consider what would happen if God's people really understood what we're reading here this morning. What Christ is saying here. And then, because we understand it, we put it into action. We start doing it. We start living it. It makes me wonder what would happen if we prayed for these things for ourselves and for our brothers and sisters as intensely as we pray for our own physical needs. Remember, that's what Jesus said. They came to him and said, Jesus, Rabbi, Rabboni, what's the greatest commandment? And what did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with every fiber and being that you are. Oh, got it. And the next is just as important as the first is what? Love your neighbor as you would love yourself. So if you're going to pay for your own physical needs and your own spiritual well-being, you're also supposed to be praying then for theirs. And think about if we did that. I think the church would just explode because a far greater proportion of its people would be living kingdom lives. 
we'd be seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then it says, all these things will be given unto you. What would happen? Our pulpits would be filled with preachers of power. I read a quote many years ago which said, as the pulpit goes, so goes the nation. As the pulpit goes, so goes the nation. And my first response to that when I first read it was, are you kidding me? I don't want to become a preacher then. You're going to put that kind of pressure on me? Our country's going to hell in a handbag and it's because of me in the pulpit? Yeah, it probably is. Because we're not preaching the gospel. We're preaching for things that tickle people's ears. I preached at a Methodist church this past week. And they came up to me afterwards. A couple of folks said, thank you. Thank you for preaching the gospel and preaching it with such conviction. And then on a ride home, I asked Sherry, I said, what are people hearing out there? What is being preached in the pulpits? So is it possible our country is where it is because of the preaching in the pulpits? The name it, claim it, preaching, the idea you can come to Jesus Christ without repenting of your sin? I also think if we did this, the mission fields would just shrink as thousands more poured out to the harvest with greater power. And Jesus said, pray for it. The harvest is plentiful, but what? The workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore we send out workers into his harvest field. Which is why last Sunday our deacon board approved to license John and Chris to the gospel ministry. They took that step. Why? Because we are equipping laborers to do the harvest. The next step is to go before the church, which will be coming shortly. J. Vernon McGee said this on these verses. How to meet the people of this world is the greatest struggle facing a child of God. Every day we rub shoulders with princesses and princes and paupers, gentlemen and scoundrels. Some folks need our friendship and help, and we need them, and we ought to pull them into our hearts. Others are rascals and will destroy us, the snakes. And we need to push them from us. How are we to know? What are we to do? We ask, we seek, and we knock. Asking means to pray with humility and a consciousness of the need. Seeking means to pray and to be active in pursuing God's will. And to knock means to point towards persistence. In other words, don't give up. If we desire to receive, find, and have doors open to us, then let us keep on asking God. Keep on seeking God. Keep on knocking at His door. Not only regarding prayer, but in all ventures worthy of our walk as Christians. Because the reality is, God does desire to help us. So my question to you today is, have you asked? Have you sought Him? Are you knocking? Ask and it will be given to you. Our Heavenly Most Merciful Father, Father, we thank you for your word. The written word, and especially the living word, Jesus Christ. Father, your son's message was clear. We can't, it can't be made any clearer. Repent, for the kingdom is here. Father, that's a message that still has to be preached today. Repent 
And you demonstrated your love that. You loved us so much that you sent him that would know no sin to become our sin. Father, we thank you for this time together. And we thank you for your word, especially the living in Jesus Christ. Amen.